Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we are grateful for this day, a day you have made for a purpose. And we know that this day you want to bring your word to us. We pray that our hearts will be receptive in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray that the Spirit of the living God will take the word we hear and interpret and apply personally to every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our eyes as we read the scriptures. I'm fasting the important truths you know we ought to have to our hearts in Jesus' name. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We have been going through the history of the early church as recorded for the prophet of the contemporary church. And we have seen a lot as had been caused to be recorded by the Holy Ghost. Activities of the members and the ministers and the missionaries in the early church. Preserved for our learning today that we through the wisdom that we gather from the scriptures may be able to live a life and work out a work that is profitable, that is great and deep and lasting for the glory of the Lord. And uh, because there is so much we're getting from this authentic history of the early church, we have been very slow. We're still in the 13th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, and yet we have uh, studied already 50 lessons out of the chapters that we've studied. And today we're having Paul's message on the missionary field. Actually, you want to understand that every believer, everyone that comes to the Lord Jesus Christ and becomes saved, in one way or the other becomes a missionary. That is, he becomes an individual with a ministry and a mission. Missionary. With a mission and a ministry. Everyone that is born again, everyone that is called a child of God, has a calling. Now, he may never actually travel beyond the borders of his own country, but there is a mission, there is a ministry. He may never go beyond um, another state or another tribe, doing the will of God, working the work of God, and sharing the love of God, and sharing what Calvary has accomplished, or the atonement of the Lord on the cross of Calvary. He may not go beyond the people that speak his own language, but he has a mission, he has a ministry. But then there are others that are sent out by the Holy Ghost himself, like God, as the Holy Ghost sent out Barnabas and Saul. For the work whereunto I have called them, as uh, the divine message came. Now, there are these people like uh, Barnabas and Saul that are sent out beyond their own cities, beyond their own countries. And they get into some areas of the land of the world which they will never have got into except for the fact that the Lord has given them a mission and a ministry. We also refer to these as missionaries. So it's uh, what we're studying today is something that is very important for every child of God. One, because now wherever you are, God wants you to carry out a mission and to be able to carry out a ministry. Two, because uh, who knows what God is preparing you for. As the Lord was meeting uh, Paul on the way to Damascus, little did he know that he will be used in a mighty way to transform the lives of many people, to open the eyes of many people within the Jewish nation and also outside the Jewish nation. And even when he was uh, being ministered to in Damascus and Ananias saw him, even though he knew that uh, God has chosen him as a vessel, but little did he know what his hands will write, what his mouth will speak, what his eyes will see, and what he'll be able to do in the lives of men and women all the world over, in his generation and in the generations to come, until the effect of his life and ministry is even felt today. As we study his life, and we, and we also study the writings that the Lord allowed him to put down before he went away. So, you don't know what the Lord is going to use you for tomorrow. Today, you may be a member of the church. Tomorrow, who knows, you may be a minister in the church. 
and uh, today you may be a minister in the church who knows tomorrow you may be a missionary sent out by the lord through the church and also into a field beyond your own country that's why as we study all these things we are opening our hearts our minds to the lord and we want him to do as he pleases in our lives in acts of the apostles chapter 13 reading from verse 14 but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down and after the reading of the law and the prophets the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them saying ye men and brethren if ye have any word of exhortation for the people say on then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said men of Israel and ye that fear God give audience or pay attention the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people even when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with an high arm brought he them out of it and about the time of 40 years suffered or permitted he their masters in the wilderness and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan he divided the land to them by lord and after that he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet and afterward he desired the king and God gave unto them Saul the son of Kish a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years and when he had removed him he raised up unto them David to be king to be their king to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed as God according to his promise raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. He continued in the message, but I want to stop in our study and analysis of these scriptures and verses today in verse 23. Paul was a master builder. The Holy Ghost allowed him to use that word when he was writing to the Corinthian church. And he said, as a master builder, wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. If God and the Spirit of God in his life made him a wise man, we learn a lot and we become wise when we look at how the Lord did the work through him. If the Lord made him a master builder, a builder and a master builder, we learn a lot by looking at how he built, how he preached, how he went about. And if he wasn't just a wise man, and if he wasn't just a master builder, but it was a combination of the two, a wise master builder. If the Lord is going to use us in planting churches, whether in this nation or outside this nation, if the Lord is going to use us in um, developing the work and building or molding the, the lives of people through the grace of God and through the washing in the blood of Jesus Christ, there is somebody who has gone on before. His name is Paul. And if we want to be wise master builders like he was, then we read the accounts of uh, how he did the work. His life and ministry offer us not only principles, but a pattern and his life and ministry throw unto us a challenge that if God can use that man in that way he can use any man in any way that pleases the Lord himself and in fulfilling our missionary assignments today we need to learn a lot from Paul the Apostle in 1st Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1 he said by inspiration he said, he said, by the leading of the Holy Ghost, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And uh, that's not only following him in his life pattern, in his lifestyle, in the crucified life, in the submissive life. That's not only following him in uh, the fact that his life was totally transformed and he was crucified with Christ. It's also following him in the wisdom that the Lord has given him 
in uh, going from place to place, planting churches and doing the work of an evangelist and getting the work of the Lord done. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. The church of today, all over the world, and this church in particular, we have a lot to learn. And whatever other churches are doing, whatever other churches are living undone, we have to address ourselves to the responsibility before us. And that is, there is a lot that has been left behind for us by the Apostle Paul. And as a church, carrying out missionary work, as a church with evangelistic thrust and outreach. There is a lot we can learn from the life and the ministry of Paul the Apostle. And as we're directed here, those things which he have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, that do. And the God of peace shall be with you. He received the call and he fulfilled it successfully. He received the call. He fulfilled it successfully. We learned something right there. That man, the Apostle Paul, was very wise, very intelligent. In fact, he was an intellectual. He was very deep in knowledge and understanding before he ever came to the Lord. In the Jewish religion that comprised of both uh, the knowledge of the Old Testament and the knowledge of their traditional laws. He said he was above his equals. He profited much above his equals. But that man with all the natural knowledge of scripture, that man with all the understanding of the Jewish society, he did not just go out without a call. He got saved. Then in the place where he was in Damascus, he preached unto the people, convincing and proving to them that Jesus is the Christ. Where he was. Everybody can do that after you are born again. Where you are. Where the, where the gospel message reached you and you received it and you were born again. You can immediately become a soul winner and you can be telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know Paul the apostle did not launch out and reach out without the voice of the Lord. Giving him a, giving him a call. Say, pray it unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Do you know we ought to be patient to receive the call of God? Hear the voice of the Lord? Not only that, you are in a lively church, a living church, a church that is listening to the Holy Ghost under a leadership that uh, hears the voice of the Lord. You ought to listen to the voice of the Lord through the church. They were ministering together in fasting and praying, and then the Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. You know, no matter how intelligent you are, you might be a genius, you have knowledge of the Bible, without the call of the Spirit, you go out, all you give out will be the letter, and the letter killeth, the letter killeth. But it is the Spirit that, that giveth life. That's why a sincere child of God, a serious child of God, a child of God that is uh, submissive to the Lord and he wants to be successful in the work of the Lord. You know what? He'll be patient to listen to that call. The Lord will call him and he will know. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. A stranger's voice will they not follow. And when a man is called, there will be that gentle impression in the heart. There will be that leading. There will be that desire that the Lord has put there that will not be overcome or drowned by many waters. Then there will be the gift in that person's life suitable for that call because when God gives a call, he also gives the gift to be able to fulfill the call. And the man with the gentle impression in the heart, with the hand of the Lord upon him, with the desire that is uh, not easily quenched with uh, rivers of waters, with circumstances in his life, he will know and sense the Lord is calling me, and with the gift the Lord is giving him. Then with a consuming desire to study the Bible, a consuming desire to study the Bible, and also with a passion for souls, a deep, deep love, deep, deep love for sinners, for those who are perishing. Now this is how you know you are being called to a particular special assignment. The impression is there. 
The hand of the Lord is there. The call of the Lord is being revealed to you in your heart. Apart from that, there is that strong a desire that, you know, any other thing in the world will not be able to replace. And the man will not be totally happy in any other employment. And no matter how he fights it, how he goes against it, he will know that the call is still there. Then there will be deep, deep love, deep love. Whenever you see human beings, he does not see them as trees walking. He sees them as human beings. And he feels for them. He knows their need in a measure. And his mind is always reach, reaching out to people. And at all this time, he's not looking for glory. He's not saying, oh, if I go out to preach, I'll be a great man. He never, never, never thinks of that. And the gift of God will be in the life of that man. And then he will find out that in the church, he belongs. In the local assembly, he'll begin to do the work of the Lord. You see, the spirit of the Lord began to move something. Began to move something. And the spirit of the Lord... Before he ever went even to the midst of those Philistines in the outside place where he had his ministry, in the camp of the children of Israel, the Spirit of the Lord began to move him. And the man that has a call will discover that in the church he belongs. The Spirit of the Lord begins to move him. Sharing his testimony, giving out the word of God, helping other people. Praying along with them, having joy in the fact that he is able to spend his life in a little way in the local church to reach out to the people that are suffering. And eventually some doors will be opening. And the Spirit of the Lord will be talking, pass through the pastor, pass through other members in the church. And then it is something that is known to the church. And then maybe the person goes out, is sent out from the church uh, to go and do this and come back. And that guilt will begin to show itself. And the man will know, I am called of God. And the call of God will begin to be fulfilled. Now, Paul received the call of God and he fulfilled it successfully. And uh, in the passage we are studying today, we see him as he went out. On this side, to the missionary field. And he carried out the work the Lord wanted him to do. And as I've said, there is a lot to learn in his attitude in his approach, in his activities, in his address, that is in the message that he gave. Now from this passage, to make us uh, have a broad understanding of the work of soul winners, evangelists, and missionaries, we'll see the work of evangelists. Uh, you know there are people that go out and they call themselves evangelists and they do not have any understanding at all what an evangelist ought to do what's the work of an evangelist they just don't know anything they don't have a clue as to the work of an evangelist but we must not be ignorant of the task the duties the responsibilities the things that the lord will expect of an evangelist or a soul winner or a missionary so we'll look at the work of an evangelist too we'll look at wisdom in evangelism no doubt you've seen people who really have testimonies of the call of God and you can tell they are called. You can even tell they have some gifts of God in their lives. You can tell they have been so desirous to help other people in witnessing, in soul winning, in evangelizing. You can tell also that the Lord has been pulling them, drawing them uh, with a strong cord of love. Love to God, love for the Bible, love to preach and love for the people of God. And love for sinners that ought to receive the message of uh, salvation, the gospel message. But they failed, they failed, they failed because they lacked wisdom. You've seen people in Bible days who failed because they lacked wisdom. There were kings in Israel. And the Lord actually appointed them as kings. They failed for lack of wisdom. There were those that inherited a great work of God. Work of God with a great magnitude in the Bible. They failed because they lacked wisdom. Even in the New Testament, there were people that were called of God. And they ought to be able to fulfill their ministry. You know why they failed? They failed because they lack wisdom. My brother, my sister, you need wisdom. You know, I have found a people who lack wisdom. 
and they talk beyond their wisdom. But if you understand human beings, you should understand this. We have two eyes, but only one mouth. That means you ought to see more than you say. That's wisdom. A person that wants to gather wisdom is opening his two eyes and he sees double before he talks once. You know, we have two ears and one mouth. And a man that is going to be wise is not going to talk more than he hears. A man that is going to learn wisdom must be silent and quiet, opening his two ears to hear because there is only one mouth. You know, there are two hands, but only one mouth. A man that is going to really do the work and is going to use wisdom, he learns how to use his two hands. Not just, not there are people that use their mouths more than their eyes, more than their ears, more than their hands, more than their legs, and they're all mouths. You know, they will not be wise, but the wise master builder is the one that recognizes i see a lot i must try to understand i hear a lot i must try to understand my hands are strong i must try to do something with with them my legs are strong and they must carry me many places and it's not just talking and talking and talking only one mouth and you know, there are people that don't learn wisdom at all. They are called of God. They are called of God. But they fail because of the lack of wisdom. And then, the word of exhortation. You know, in the passage I read to you in verse 15. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, word of exhortation for the people, say on. And uh, when the evangelist goes out, he knows there is a work to do. He knows that work must be done in wisdom. And then there is the word of exhortation. What's he going to preach? How is he going to preach? What's he going to lay line upon line, precept on precept, before the people, so that the work will be done? Now, let's see. The work of evangelists. In Acts chapter 13, verses 4 and 5. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. From thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. Verse 13 and verse 14. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and sat down. Now you see there is a lot in these uh, four verses I've read to you. A lot that we cannot possibly cover in a short time. But I just point out some little, little things to you. An evangelist is a person that doesn't stay in one spot, in one place to carry out his work. He goes from place to place. Have you seen that in verses 4 and 5? Have you seen uh, places, different places mentioned in connection with some, with the same group, the same team of people? In verse 4, they departed unto Seleucia. In verse 4, they sailed to Cyprus. In verse 5, they were at Salamis. In verse 13, they loosed from Paphos. And in uh, verse 13, they came to Paga in Pamphylia. In verse 14, from Perga, they departed and they came unto Antioch. Not the Antioch you read of before, but the Antioch in Pisidia. You see, always on the go, always on the move. What does a soul winner do? A soul winner has a time of learning in the church, but that soul winner has a time of going from house to house. What does an evangelist do? An evangelist has a time that he stays in the base church to receive commission, to receive encouragement, and to receive uh, the 
uh, help and the prayers of the children of God. But the evangelist has a time. He moves out from city to city, from village to village. And when he goes, he's not going on adventure. He's not going on sightseeing. He's going preaching the gospel. That's an evangelist. A missionary has a time. He has been in the church in his own country. But if he's a real missionary, he has a time. In fact, his heart is, his heart is on the missionary field. And he has a time, he goes into that new country, and when he gets there, he just, he does not stay in one spot, in one place. He goes from city to city. That's a missionary. And his impact is felt in, felt in that nation, felt in that community. In Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verses 20 and 21. Yea, or yes. So have I strived or endeavored to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. That's an evangelist striving, endeavoring to preach the gospel, not stealing sheep belonging to other congregations, not targeting believers, those who are already born again in other churches and wanting to draw, draw them to his own church. But he wants to get to the place uh, where they have not heard the gospel. Where Christ has not been named. Where Christ has not been known. And he wants to invite them to the Lord. And then that, so that lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom it was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard shall understand. You know, actually, for missionaries that are really called, for missionaries that are uh, really equipped, for missionaries that have the gift of God upon their lives, there are so many pagans in the world. There are so many people not born again yet in the world. That uh, a missionary doesn't need to uh, go into a country and uh, get the people that are already born again. Only conversing pe for people that are already born again. A real evangelist is a person that has the gift of God and the grace of God and the power of God in his life. And is able to go to a virgin land, a virgin area. And is able to draw idol worshippers and sinners and pagans. Uh, with the preaching of the gospel and with the power of the gospel and draw them to the Lord Jesus Christ. In um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. But watch thou in all things and do afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Do it. Do the work of an evangelist. An evangelist has a work to do. An evangelist cannot be a lazy man. That has a, a sickness you call sleeping sickness. That will wake up 10 o'clock in the morning and will feel weak and not feel to do anything at all. An evangelist or a missionary is somebody that is very active and uh, has a strength and has power, physical power, spiritual power to carry out the work. And uh, it's a real work. It's a real work that demands energy. That demands intelligence, that demands wisdom, that demands education, that demands uh, the Spirit of God, that demands everything you have. The grace of God, the gift of God, the physical energy, the spiritual power, it demands everything. And it's a work that cannot be done by people that are lazy. By people that uh, you know always complaining of uh, there is a lion in the way and I cannot go. There are difficulties in the way I cannot go. An evangelist has a work to do, and it is a work for people who are diligent and determined that the thing will be done. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. Now we've seen that an evangelist is a person that goes about, and when he goes about, what he does that he preaches the gospel. Vigilant and watchful for open doors, he loses no time in bringing the message to the audiences that are waiting. You know, the hazards for Paul, the hazards were great, and yet those hazards could not hinder the progress of the missionary team. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, let's see his experience, just a bit of it. In verse 26, in journeys often. If you're an evangelist, that is true in your life. In journeys often, if you're a missionary, that is true in your life and ministry. In the nation, in the country where the missionary is sent, he will not just stay in one place. 
He wants to know all the towns there. He wants to know the need. He wants to see the people. He wants to see where there are open doors. He wants to see where the call is coming. And the moment he gets into that nation, he's distributing literature. He's distributing uh, materials that uh, will make the people of that nation to know that a missionary has come. And he wants to be a blessing to the people of that nation. And um, perhaps he'll develop a mailing list. And all these uh, people in the nation will be writing to him from all the various uh, parts of the country. And if you know a real missionary that wants to do the work of an evangelist, he will not complain, well, I have no means of transportation. Well, Paul did not have a personal boat, a personal ship to go all about. But then he did the work like no other person did. And we're to learn from him. A real missionary that is determined in doing the work of the Lord is not complaining, oh, I wish I had a vehicle of my own. I wish I had a, perhaps a personal aeroplane to be able to go around. You know, Paul did not have all that, and yet he did the work of a missionary, the work of an evangelist in journeys often, in perils of waters. A real missionary is a person that is bold and aggressive. It's a person that doesn't care for an easy life, a life of, um, a life of luxury. He is a person that uh, even looks at danger and he faces that danger and he, play, he goes through, he gets the work done in perils of robbers, in perils of my, by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, watching soften, hunger, thirst, in fasting soften, in cold and nakedness. You see that? That's a missionary. That's an evangelist. An evangelist is not uh, you know, looking for an air-conditioned house with a rug on the floor. And except he has a place that is very, very convenient, very, very convenient, and he sees the type of food he's been eating in his own country, except he sees that he will not be able to launch out and do the work. That's not an evangelist. That's an adventurer who just wants to know another nation. A real missionary is a person who is very strong physically, strong in conviction, strong in the call of the Lord, and he wants to get it done no matter the physical difficulties in the way. Money or no money, if he has the Spirit of God, he has what he needs. Now, that's the work of an evangelist. How about wisdom? Wisdom in evangelism. In Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 13, Verses 14 to 16. Now we're looking at uh, the pattern in the missionary outreach or the missionary work of Paul the Apostle. Remember, he was a wise master builder. And uh, get near a wise man, you'll be wise. Become intimate with the life of a wise man, you'll be wise. Discuss if possible with a wise man, you'll be wise. Come under the leadership and under the direction, under the direct influence of a wise man, you'll be wise. Read about that wise man. Follow him from city to city. Follow him from place to place. And look at how he opens his mouth, how he preaches the word of God. And look at how he carries, how he carries out the assignment of the Lord given to him. You'll be wise. Share with a wise man. Lock yourself up with him, with Paul the Apostle, the wise master builder. And just see the wisdom of God in his life. See the wisdom of God in his life. Sleep with him. Meditate upon the word. Meditate upon the way he did the work. You want to be an evangelist or want to be a missionary and you've never studied about the life and the ministry of Paul the Apostle. How will you do it? Because that was a pioneer in missionary work. A real pioneer. With the power of God. With a real divine purpose determined upon him. And he did successfully. Get near that wise man and you will be wise. Now let's see the wisdom he manifested. In evangelism. Paul the apostle. This is great. In Acts chapter 13. From verse 14. But when he departed from Perga. They came unto Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. 
went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Didn't I tell you, if you're a wise man, you must use your eyes before you use your mouth? You must use your legs and use your hands before you use your mouth? You must use your ears and listen to what is going on around you before, before you use your mouth. You know, Paul the Apostle, with the Spirit of God upon him, power of God upon him, you know what he did? He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Did he go straight to the platform? He sat down. Let's be wise. Have you gone to the missionary field? What do you do when you get there? The very first day you get there, what do you do? At the airport while they're, uh, you know, processing your immigration papers, you start preaching the gospel? Why? Sit down first. Look at the people first. Learn about their, about their way of life first. See how they see. Open your eyes, open your ears, use your legs. Go around, use your hands. Before you use your mouth, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he sat down. Uh, do you know that uh, everywhere Paul the Apostle went, um, those days, most of the places, wherever there was a synagogue, he went into that synagogue first. Let me just run you through some references. Acts chapter 9, verse 20. Acts chapter 9, verse 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. In chapter 14, verse 1. It came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue, into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Gentiles, believed. In Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Am Am Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, you see the wise master builder? Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, that's into the synagogue, and three Sabbath days reason with them out of the scriptures in uh, chapter 18 verses 4 and 5 and he reasoned in the synagogue every sabbath and persuaded the jews and the greeks in chapter 18 but verse 19 and he came to ephesus and led them there and he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the jews in chapter 19 and verse Hey. Now, Paul the Apostle went into the synagogue and he did so on the Sabbath day. That's so deep uh, that a babe cannot understand. That's so deep that um, a person who has just come into the church but will not use his eyes and his ears will never understand, will never learn. Now, understand this Paul the Apostle knew that the Sabbath had been abolished, but the Jews did not know that the Sabbath had been abolished. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, worshipping the Lord actually on a Sabbath day. But you know, he got into a new place. And this new place, they gathered a crowd together on a Sabbath day. Did he say, did they become so bigoted as a religious fellow and say, well, I will not go into the synagogue because today is a Sabbath day because I know the Sabbath has been abolished. He knew that. He was not under that law. He was under grace. But if the crowd is there and an evangelist is always looking for the crowd, a missionary is always looking for the people, and if the people are there, it may be on Saturday or Friday. It may be a Monday or Tuesday. It may be Sunday or Wednesday. Whatever the day, whatever the time, if the crowd is there, an evangelist that has wisdom will find out to get into that crowd. A crowd of sinners already there. Waiting for the preaching of the gospel. Just coming this a uh, Saturday, every Saturday. Sabbath day. So Paul the apostle, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. What did he preach when he got there? That the Sabbath day is abolished? No. <laughs> Paul is wiser than that. It's not going to raise up doors and begin controversy at the first meeting. He's going to preach the most important message ever given to man to preach. The message, Jesus Christ. If there is time, later, he might talk about the abolition of uh, the Sabbath. 
after the after the people had been saved after they had been born again and now as a church he wants to teach them doctrine but you know when he met a group of those sinners he wasn't going to teach doctrine he wasn't going to talk about uh, anything controversial he was going to talk about jesus christ the savior jesus christ the life and the light of the world that's wisdom and you see an evangelist is like that an evangelist is like that a missionary is like that he was wise now, why did he go to the synagogues in particular? Well, three basic reasons. Number one, the synagogues provided a ready-made audience for Paul. Somebody else has done the publicity. Somebody else had gathered them. Somebody else had built the synagogue. And somebody else had, had provided pews and all the things that they were using sitting down. And the crowd was there. Somebody else had built a pulpit. And you have a ready audience, a ready crowd waiting for the missionary. And as a wise master builder, the crowd was ready. He, he was ready with the message. He went there. The only place he could go to get them and get the greatest number of them, the Jews. The synagogue and it was there wise wise number two there was a receptive audience uh, who already accepted the old testament as the word of god you know the people that went to synagogues two sets of people number one jews number two proselytes who are gentiles these jews had accepted that the old testament is the word of god isn't it easy to preach when you've got some people that believe that from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of the Old Testament, that they believe it as the word of God. And they are not going to allow anything to touch it at all. Even though they were not born again, even though they did not know the Christ of the scriptures. But they believe that the scriptures have been given so that we'll be drawn nearer to God. They already believed that the word of God was the wisdom of God. And if somebody will just come and take that word of God and take them from the position where they were, knowing and accepting the Old Testament as the word of God, take them from that position and just lead them to Christ, that person will be wise. And that's why Paul, first of all, went to the synagogue wherever there was a synagogue. Number three... You know, Paul, from the beginning till the end of his life, had a deep concern for the Jews. According to him, he said, my kinsmen, the children of Israel. He knew that they had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. And his heart cried out after them. And everywhere he went, he, he was drawn to them. Well, that is wise. Remember what Jesus told his own disciples before he left when they were going out on a, a some missionary assignment, evangelistic assignment? Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you know, wherever Paul went, he followed that principle. If there were Jews there, he said, Unto you first, the gospel should come. Come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel first. And after that, he'll be reaching out uh, to the rest of the community. And that was wisdom. Now an evangelist or missionary will use wisdom and enter through already open doors. Or use appropriate keys to open closed doors. It is unwise, it is foolish to spend a lifetime trying to open doors without the key. And in the synagogue, Paul spoke to men, ye men of Israel, that is the Jews, and then ye that fear God, that is Gentile proselytes. And we should learn from the spiritual wisdom in evangelism that had been given to the Apostle Paul. Now let's see Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. We're looking at verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. You wonder why you've not been able to win your wife? Why you've not been able to win your neighbors? Why you've not been able to win the co-workers? Perhaps you do not have the wisdom of the evangelist, the wisdom of the soul winner. He that winneth souls is wise. Wise. And the best way you get wisdom that I know is that you get near people that already have got that wisdom. You know, Jesus Christ, the very wisdom of God. And his life is given to us in the New Testament. His ministry, his conversations, 
It's relationships. It's interactions. It's way of preaching. It's way of approaching a stranger. It's way of approaching a sinner. It's way of approaching people that uh, are ignorant. You know the wisdom of God in Jesus Christ. Now you want to be wise as a soul winner. Be more intimate with Jesus. Read his life a story. Read about his ministry. And you know this, Apostle Paul, as we study him, because uh, the days ahead of us, we'll be learning much about Paul. Coming to Athens, coming to where they are swallowed up with superstition, coming to the, uh, uh, the city of the Jews, coming to the places where they just uh, will not accept, just ordinarily like that. And yet, the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God. And uh, in the Old Testament, too, you have people that had wisdom. Women. There are some women in uh, this Old Testament. Just looking at them, they could tame a lion of a man. I mean, those women. And uh, sometimes you see some of these women in the Old Testament, and a person like King David will be saying, Well, I'm going to kill off that individual. I'm going to kill off that individual. And. Uh, when this man is saying David was about to lose his sense and lose uh, all restraint and control over himself, a woman just came along. You know what she did? She tamed him and calmed him down. Wisdom. The wisdom of God. And have you heard about Solomon? That said, oh Lord, all that I want is wisdom. And that man, God gave him wisdom. Read about his life. And then in the book of the Proverbs, he has preserved unto us a compilation of words of wisdom. Words of wisdom. Words of wisdom. And as a person that is going to work for the Lord, a person that is going to really carry out a great work for the Lord, get intimate, get associated, get very near the people in the Bible that manifested the wisdom of God. He that winneth souls will be wise. Has to be. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now stop right there. What happens to a foolish sheep in the midst of wolves? Will be eaten up, turned to pieces. What happens to a foolish a person, a soul winner, a person that is witnessing to other people uh, among violent, aggressive sinners? There will be controversy and argument, and they might tear all his bring into pieces. And Jesus said, Behold, I send you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. What happens to a missionary on a foreign field that has left his own country? And it's now in the midst of people, he doesn't understand their language, he doesn't understand their culture, he doesn't understand their lifestyle, he doesn't understand their religious uh, misgivings and bigotry, he doesn't understand all the controversies in that nation. What happened to, to him if he gets into that country and he behaves foolishly? His ministry will be turned up. He will not do anything substantial for the Lord. Be wise. Be wise. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise, wise as serpents. What did Jesus uh, mention serpents? Because all over the nation of Israel, everybody felt that among all those uh, animals, the serpent or the snake was the wisest. Uh, you know, in our own nation, Whenever we tell stories, and we tell stories to young people, I mean our grand grandmothers in the moonlight, whenever they tell us stories, they associate wisdom with tortoise. Did you hear me? Our grandmothers, I mean old, old grandmothers, whenever they tell us stories, they associate wisdom with what? With tortoise. And you know all those uh, stories they tell us, all those parables they tell us, all those things they tell us. If they are going to talk about wisdom, eventually, you know, mother is going to mention tortoise. 
But you know, in Israel, they associated wisdom with uh, a serpent. And Jesus uh, said, all those uh, stories you've been hearing about the wisdom of serpent, you must be wise, wise as serpent. So that everybody, the story they hear about you, the thing they know about you, is that that man, if they're going to tell any story, they'll be talking about the wisdom. In every area of your life. And at the same time, harmless as those. Now, that regulates the type of wisdom Jesus Christ was talking about. A serpent is harmful. But the Lord was making use of the serpent to just say that, well, you are wise, but not that you have in the nature of a serpent and you become harmful, you are still harmless as those. But wise, really wise. And if you are going to be a successful missionary, a successful evangelist, even a successful zonal leader in our church here, a successful area leader in our church here, even a successful house fellowship leader in our church here, you can't do without wisdom, the wisdom of God. And to have that wisdom, you get near the wise people in the Bible. Get near them. Read their writings, read the activities of their lives, and you will be wise. Be intimate, be associated with the wise men of the Bible. Wisdom will be yours. And now the word of exhortation. In Acts chapter 13, from verse 15. And after the reading of the law, and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue, sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, Say on, my brothers, the Bible has given us the whole answer to all our problems. If you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. But the person who gave the call did not know the leading preacher. He said, ye men and brethren. Barnabas was there, Paul was there. Perhaps others were there because out of all their missionary journeys, there might have been some brethren that now followed them because they talk of Paul and the company. But now, as the leading person said in the synagogue, ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation, say on. What will happen if uh, two of them at the same time were going to the platform? And... Uh, Barnabas was telling Paul, go back now, I will talk today. And Paul was saying, you don't have the knowledge I have, keep quiet, let me do it. And they were arguing, nobody will be saved. Have you ever seen some so-called soul winners in the bus? Three of them, and there is an audience, and somebody wants to talk. This one is talking, this one is talking, that one is talking. Are they working for the master? No, sir. They are working for themselves. Have you seen a missionary team that goes on to the mission field? The husband is there, the wife is there. But the wife has a desire also to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. What a man can do, a woman can do. And with that mentality of arrogance and egotism, pride, while the husband is trying to get a message across, she also is saying, I can even preach better than my husband. I can do that thing my husband is doing and do more. And uh, we don't actually know who is preaching the gospel, who is actually handling the meeting of the day. And sometimes they have to argue and argue as to who does this, who does that. How foolish, how selfish. You know the problem? If we were really sanctified, listen to me. If we were sanctified beyond the testimony of sanctification, if we were sanctified beyond the word of mouth, if we were sanctified beyond assumption, supposition, the argument will not be there. Because a sanctified woman will recognize, number one, that the husband is the head of the home. And the husband is the one that received the ministry. It's just that you are having the privilege, the privilege of sharing that ministry together. And if all you do in the missionary work is quietly staying and praying for your husband, supporting for your husband, you have done a great, mighty work. But you know, selfishness in an unsanctified heart 
will want to compete and want to show that I too can preach. After all, when I was in Nigeria, when I was uh, still back at home, before I ever got married, I was a dynamic uh, evangelism team leader. Are you? We must be wise, wise, wise. You know, without wisdom, the work will be destroyed. And sometimes you send two men out. And you send them to go and get the work done. Well, let me tell you this. You have to pay attention now. God, you see, is only one speaker at a time. And he does it this way. Two people are going out. And they're going to get the work done. And they, in heaven, God Almighty has decided it is Paul that is going to handle the situation for this place. But not Barnabas. You know what God will do? God will put a heavy anointing of the Spirit on Paul. And at that time, he will not put the same heavy anointing on Barnabas. So there will be no argument at all. And they just look at one another. And there is that ready anointing and the Spirit and the power of God upon Paul. And he opens his mouth and he goes on. And Barnabas doesn't have to struggle because that heavy anointing is not on him at that time. Finished. That's how God does it. And you know, it's, uh, if uh, it's going to be Barnabas, they will just discover. Because God walking with them, God sending them out. At that very time, the heavy anointing will be about, upon Barnabas. The word of exhortation will be in him. The, the opening up of the scriptures will be in him. And they will know, both of them will know. Paul will know that the heavy anointing is not upon him for, the, for that time. And looking at the other fellow, if the heavy anointing is on him and you are spiritual, you can easily discern. You can easily see the anointing is upon you, carry it on. But you know, when there is no understanding of the anointing of God, and we do not even allow the Lord to decide, when two people are sent out, three people are sent out, argument comes. Who does this? Who does this? Who does that? Confusion comes. But you know, when the people said, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation to the people, say on. In verse 16, Then Paul stood up. No other person stood up. My brother, God is not the author of confusion. No other person stood up. Paul stood up. And he beckoning, be beckoning. And with his hand, said, Men of Israel, And ye that fear God, give audience or pay attention you know sometimes i tell you pay attention or look up at me here and sometimes uh, when i say pay attention well you say that's how the pastor talks so keep on doing what you are doing and you miss what god wanted to say or i say give audience or look up at me here just to catch your attention to make sure that this sentence this principle of life or this principle of success you don't miss it give audience and then he said the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with an eye arm brought the heathen out of it and about the time of 40 years suffered he their manners in the wilderness and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land unto them by lot. After that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 430 years unto Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they desired a king. And uh, God gave them Saul, the son of Kish a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed, that God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a savior, Jesus. Now, let's learn something from... The message. We know the story. 
And so we are not just uh, going to be going around in the Old Testament and showing how they spent 40 years in the wilderness, how they were in Egypt, how they went into the land of Canaan, how the land was divided to them, how they were under judges and uh, giving you the names of those judges one by one and how Samuel was born, how Samuel became a prophet. No, that's not the point. The point is this. That when you give the word of exhortation, you know in that place, uh, uh, the message contained four definite ingredients, four definite things, very important for the, for the believer, the preacher, the evangelist, the missionary to know. Number one, there was a reading or recitation of the scriptures. You know, even though he was not uh, going from chapter something verse something, there was a recitation of scripture. Because they had already read the scriptures in verse 15. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue said unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So then, if you are preaching, what, what do you do? Number one, you read scripture. You read scripture. Or you recite the scripture. Or you repeat some of the scriptures they have known, but maybe they have not known the interpretation. They have not known where the scriptures were leading. And uh, you know there are people who attempt to preach the gospel without actually reading scriptures, without even relating it to the scriptures. Number two, relevance to the society. You know where he was? He was in the synagogue. You know the people that were there? Ye men of Israel... And ye that fear God, the Jews and the proselytes who had been circumcised so that they will have um, an inheritance or they will have a portion in the worship of the God of Israel. If there is anything those people knew, they knew the Old Testament scriptures very well. And in their situation, anybody that came and they opposed that will be rejected immediately without allowing him to finish his message. And when you go as a missionary, what do you, as you are preaching, you read the scriptures to them, then you are relevant to the society. You study that society. You look at their culture. You look at their lifestyle. And then you will not be foolish as a missionary to be uh, the first message you give or the, uh, the first months you are there. Even the first few months you are there, all you are talking about is uh, mentioning sin one by one and spending one hour to describe sin and only five minutes to talk about the Savior. Well, when you do that, their sin is more pronounced than the Savior. When you do that, you are teaching the law and law never imparts faith into the heart of anybody. Do's and don'ts will never give anybody faith to believe God. But you know, he talked about Jesus Christ. That's the greatest message. That's the greatest message. You read about the preachers in the New Testament. They were not, uh, you know, going down with lists and uh, picking up fornication and spending 30 minutes on that and describing how people of this nation, how they commit fornication and then go to stealing and spend another 20 minutes on that and go to another scene and spend 10 minutes on that. And then at the end of it, spend five minutes talking about the Savior. They never did that in the Bible. Come back to the Bible. Come back to the Bible. And introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ who has power to save, power to save, power to deliver, power to set free. Show them the truth, the truth of grace, the truth of God, the truth of pardon, the truth from Calvary, the truth of atonement, the truth of the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Show it to them. Of course, we talk about sin before we talk about the Savior, but... That doesn't mean that we paint the sin and we make fun of the sinners and we talk as if, uh, you know, all those sinners are uh, profligates and they're so bad, they're so evil, they're so condemned and eventually you just tag the name of Jesus at the end of the message. That's not preaching. That's not preaching. That's just looking for people to condemn. But you know, they were relevant to the society. Relevant to the society. They brought about the scriptures that talked about the people in that nation. And those people, they paid attention because they saw that this wise master builder, think about it, wise master builder, he was telling them the story of their nation, the story of how they developed, and he was telling them the story of how Jesus came through them, relevance to the society. Number three, reaching the soul, refreshing the spirit. 
You know when those two people were going on the way to Emmaus and Jesus met them? And Jesus started from the writings of Moses and from the, right, from the law and the prophets and he explained the scriptures to them from the time of Moses to the time of the prophet, seeing concerning him. You know what he said later? Did not our hearts burn when he spoke to us? By the way, it touched their soul, their spirit. It touched them emotionally and it touched their will and it made them to want to do something about it. You know, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 37, when Peter, the apostle, had preached, they were pricked in their hearts. They were pricked in their hearts. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter told them, repent, and be baptized in the name of Jesus, and ye shall receive the gift of the, the remission of your sin, and for the remission of sins, and then ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, when we preach, number one, you read or recite the scripture, then you relate it, or you are relevant to the society in which you are preaching, and then you reach the soul. Not just reaching the mind, reach the soul. Touch the, touch the soul of that man with the word of God. Let it go straight into his spirit, into his heart, until he's asking the question, what shall we do? And eventually, tell them, never miss out on this one. Tell them, redemption through the Savior. Redemption through the Savior. Redemption through the Savior. And uh, you need to see this. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. This part of a message the last part of the message that Peter preached, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. What did he end up with? Redemption through the Savior. And then in Acts chapter 3 verse 26, unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning everyone away from his iniquity. What did he end up with? Redemption through the Savior. Chapter 4, from verse 10. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is a stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What is that? Redemption through the Savior. In Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, verse 42, daily in the temple, and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. Redemption through the Savior. Chapter 6 of Acts. And verse 14, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. In Acts chapter 8, verse 5, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Chapter 8 of Acts of the Apostles, verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him. Jesus. Chapter 9, verse 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that is the Son of God. In verse 22, but Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. And in chapter 10, from verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and walketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, his Lord of all. And in chapter 11, verses 20 and 21, and some of them which were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come unto Antioch, to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Preaching the Lord Jesus. And so in the same way we find Paul the Apostle here, reading and reciting scripture, becoming relevant to the society, and then reaching the soul and refreshing their spirit and touching their heart. 
and at the same time telling them redemption comes only through one source and it is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Redemption through the Savior. In Acts chapter 13 verse 23, of this man's seed, as God according to his promise raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. A lot of wisdom we're learning from the scriptures on how to evangelize, on how to do the work of an evangelist, on how to carry out a missionary assignment. I pray that what we have learned today will make us do the work of the Lord better in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up and pray. Have you seen why you have failed? But there is wisdom in the scriptures. Surrender yourself to the wisdom of God. Wisdom of God. As a soul winner, as a Christian worker, not the wisdom of the world. Learn from the scriptures. Be a soul winner that wins souls wisely. Jesus is a savior. He saves from sin. Proclaim him as the savior and the redeemer and he will save and redeem the people.